Now that's some deep stuff. Not the not the people who followed Jesus every day for three years. None of them are considered the giant of Christian thought. But the person who had this Christophany, and I'll break that down in a moment, this 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 encounter with Christ on the so-called Damascus Road, this person becomes the giant of Christian thought. And let's deal with that for a moment. Let's deal with that, okay? Let's talk about uh, the experience that Paul had, okay? And as a Jew of the so-called dispersion, he was born according to the biblical text in Tarsus, okay? And, and another thing while I'm on that, okay? Everything that I'm going to share about Paul, everything that I'm going to talk about, Okay, every, everything that I'm going to say that he taught is all in the Bible. Please understand that. And the reason for that, brothers and sisters, is because there is no evidence outside of the Bible to validate the existence of a guy known as Saul of Tarsus, which became Paul of the Christian faith. There is no evidence whatsoever that shows or speaks of this guy named Paul outside or apart from the Bible. All literature that talks about Paul is founded upon what is said in the Bible about Paul. So when you go to the Christian bookstore and you pick up books about Paul, okay, uh, the Apostles of the Gentiles, Paul, okay, uh, you know, the great teacher, Paul, okay, whatever you read in another book is still was taken from what the Bible says about Paul. Outside of the Bible, apart from the Bible, there is no evidence anywhere on this planet that this man named Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, ever historically existed. Okay? And not only Paul, but actually any other person you mentioned in the Bible. Okay? There is actually no evidence whatsoever anywhere on this planet of their existence. Okay? And I, I usually get into some serious discussions with people about that. You know? Um, from Adam in the book of Genesis to John, the apostle on the Isle of Patmos in the book of the Revelation, there is no evidence of anyone mentioned in the Bible having ever historically physically existed or walking this planet. Okay? Uh, there, you can't find one burial site for anybody mentioned in the Bible. There's no burial site for that. Okay? Uh, and, and all of and if you have uh, I take it back, I scratch that. I know you have a critical thinking mind. If you exercise your critical thinking faculties, you would have to be honest with yourself and say, wow, that is something to think about. Okay? Um, you know, and sometimes when we're talking with people and, and, and they, you know, I say, they, they argue, well, I can't show you where Jesus was buried because he got up from the grave. I, I say, well, being that I know that you're Christian and that's your parameter, I give you that. I say, okay, let's say he did get up from the grave. All right, so you, of course you can't show me where he's buried because he would have gotten up. He would have resurrected. So how about showing me where Peter's grave is? Okay, I'll show, show me where Thomas's grave is. Show me where James's grave is. Okay, uh, show me where Bartholomew's grave is. Show me where Paul's grave is. Show me anybody's grave. Show me John's grave. Okay, uh, you can't. It can't be done. Show me David's grave. Show me uh, Adam's grave. Show me. Show me. Any, show me Samuel's grave. Show me Elijah's grave. Show me Ezekiel's grave. You can't do it because they do not exist. Okay, and I know that what I'm saying is, is, is punching some of you right now in the chest, like a like a balled up fist hitting at full force. I don't mean to, I don't mean to um, attack your belief system. I'm just sharing fact with you, brothers and sisters. See, there's a difference between fact and faith. And when you really get right down to it, most of us are where we are based on faith. I'm sharing a factual statement with you, okay? There are no graves to be found of anyone mentioned in the biblical text. And yet, I can take you, well, I can't take you right now tonight, but if you go with me to Egypt, I can show you the graves and tombs and, 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 and sarcophagi of people that date back 10,000 years ago. Okay, so let's 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 keep it real, man. Let's let's not get caught up in a fantasy. Okay, I'm trying to give you fact tonight, and I hope you will receive it as that. 
okay, and not as an attack on your faith. I don't mean to attack your faith tonight. That is not my purpose. Okay, so let's look at this carefully. Paul of the Bible was supposedly unconsciously being prepared by his contacts with the Euro Gentile world for his role as a missionary around the Mediterranean basin. And at the, you know, it's really deep here because the largest single influence upon the life of Paul, according to the Bible, the largest single influence on his life was his Hebraic environment, including his supposed home training and his supposed education under a great Jewish scholar that the Bible refers to as Gamaliel. And for proof of that, you would look at Acts 22. Let me turn there with you. The 22nd chapter of Acts, verse 3. Okay? Uh, so let's turn there. And just bear with me because I'm flipping pages here. Okay? Acts 22 and 3, uh, where Paul is supposedly giving his testimony. He says, I am verily, or I am truly, a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, okay, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as you all are this day. So he says here in this verse that he was taught at the feet of a supposed Jewish scholar by the name of Gamaliel, which still, at which there is no evidence or records of his existence either. We don't find any of his writings or anything like that. Okay, but of course Acts 22 and 3 says that Paul was uh, taught by Gamaliel. So for the sake of the fact that it does say that, let's suppose that that did happen. Okay, uh, as, as you see that his testimony is evident from his extensive use of the Old Testament and from his handling of the material which reflects his so supposed rabbinic uh, instruction and as a Pharisee, in which which you supposedly that, okay, he strove valiantly to defend his fidelity to the law, okay, uh, but the futility of his effort is revealed through his so-called teaching of the subject in which he speaks. Paul's zeal as a persecutor. Okay, as revealed in the biblical text, must be traced to his conviction that the followers of Jesus were mistaken in identifying him as Israel's Messiah. Okay, and follow what I'm saying. Okay, Paul was supposedly actually what you may call one of the most powerful zealots in biblical literature as far as defending uh, the faith of, of the Hebrew faith. Okay, and of course, and Hebrew is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Okay, uh, so the so-called uh, concept of, of Jesus being the Messiah or or the Son of God that was that was a complete contradiction to uh, the so-called Jewish faith, and so Paul felt the need to defend the Jewish faith. Okay, so feelings of humanity uh, were repressed, according to the biblical text, in order to do service to God by stamping out what this man felt was a heresy. Okay, uh, but the Christophany, and I, I mentioned that earlier, uh, the Christophany, and by the way, that's spelled C H I R. S-T-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Christophany. A Christophany, brothers and sisters, is what, you would, what we would call a visual manifestation of Christ. That's what a theophany is. Okay? Uh, a theophany, uh, being the root Latin word theos, would be God. So a theophany would be a visual manifestation of God. Okay? Um... So understand how that goes. For example, uh, uh, an example of a theophany would be uh, the burning bush that Moses supposedly communicated with as the as the image or the visual manifestation of God. Okay, uh, not that God, not that the burning bush was God. 
Okay, but it was a theophany, meaning a visual manifestation of God. 